you here. Um, today we are here uh, to have a challenge of disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly. We are so excited about all the, the agenda, the events that are going on today. We're going to have breakout sessions, great music, and of course our speaker. So we are very, very excited. So let's open in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this time together. Uh, thank you that we as women can come together, learn more about you, and that we would take away today things that would help us be more bold in our faith as we interact with other women and people throughout this world. We thank you again for this time. Bless the presenter, bless, bless the attendees. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty, so we're going to go ahead and start singing, and Ms. Geraldine's going to come lead us in a few songs. And now we're going to have a special by Miss Michelle. She's going to come sing for us.
Alrighty, so now I'm going to welcome uh, Penny Durego, and she's going to introduce our speaker for today. Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to see you here. We're in for a really treat, a big treat today with Allison Hale as our speaker. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce her. Allison and her husband, Gary, have lived in San Pedro, Dominican Republic since 2003. They have a church, they have a Christian school, and many other outreach programs. Allie works specifically with women of the street who are exploited in the sex tourism industry, many of them beginning as children. Allie gives them hope by showing them Jesus, providing them work, and giving them alternatives to their life on the streets. She also is a great lover of strong coffee. She loves shoes. And she loves football. A little personal in there. Um, I so admire this woman and the work that she does for our Lord Jesus. So I'd like you, and I think you will also, so I'd like to introduce to you Allison Hale. I do love coffee, and the coffee downstairs or over at the thing was just a little bit not as strong as the coffee in the Dominican Republic. <laughs> the, um, the coffee in the Dominican Republic is strong. I mean, we just, uh, you wake up and it's, you know, I mean, it will literally, I think my grandmother passed away a couple years ago and I'm like, just give her some coffee. Maybe she'll just, you know, some Dominican <laughs> coffee and she will rise from the dead. It is very, very strong. Um, I was telling a story. We just went through a hurricane scare in the Dominican Republic, and now we've gone through a really long um, uh, drought, and so when a hurricane comes anywhere near us, the Dominicans are like, we just want a little bit of rain. It can just, you know, and so, and we're really praying for the people of the Bahamas because we were expecting it to hit the Dominican. We canceled, I, we canceled workshop, we canceled everything because we're so close to the ocean that we were just really afraid that it, that it, and it was headed right toward us, and um, and we are really praying for uh, the people of the Bahamas and and on the East Coast as well. We haven't had a, a hurricane hit in about 21 years, and so we kind of feel like oh, we're due every year. We just get nervous, and um, but a few years ago we had one kind of hit close, 
Uh, and so it was right at the beginning when we started the school. We, uh, we started a school in 2009, and it was in a tiny little house, and every time it rained, or every time somebody walked by and spit, the, the, rain, the street would flood. It would just, it was flooded, and it would come into the school. So at 5 o'clock in the morning, the other administrator of the school called me and said, the school's full of full of water, the storm has lasted all night long, and it was, it was a tropical storm that was passing very close to, uh, to us. And so we went out, Diomanis and I went out um, early in the morning, we were five o'clock in the morning, and we're just bucketing out water out of the school, we're sweeping it out, it's coming back in, we're sweeping it out, it's coming back in, and um, right in the middle of this tropical storm, I'm in the middle of the street pouring out a bucket of water, and I smelled coffee. And the rain is still pouring, and thunder is still light. Thunder and lightning are still happening. And I, I stop, and I just start yelling in Spanish, "Who's brewing coffee?" I just walk up and down the street, "Who's brewing coffee?" "Quién está colando café?" I'm like right in the middle, "Who is brewing coffee?" And uh, this uh, this older lady, about two doors down from the school, she came out. She's like, "I'm co- I'm brewing coffee," and I'm like, "Okay, let's have some of that, please." And uh, <laughs> And if you've ever been to the Dominican Republic, which a few of you have, she did not bring me a plastic cup of coffee. She brought me a cup of coffee and a little, and a little demitasse cup on a saucer with a napkin in the middle of a hurricane, and I'm standing in the middle of the street. <sighs> okay. Thank you very much. But that is typical Dominican. I've, uh, we've gone to villages all over the island of the Dominican Republic. And I, you can just go into a little store and you can buy a little envelope full of Santo Domingo coffee. And you can just buy five pesos worth of sugar. And so you just want, I just want a little bit of sugar. And so then you've got an a envelope full of coffee and you've got a little bit of sugar. And then you're like, is there anybody around here who can brew this for me? Oh, absolutely. You would just walk down the street and this lady will brew it for you and give it to you. And so I've, I've done that all over the Dominican Republic. So that's, that is my kind of my MO. All right, that is what I am known for. Um, my parents and I were missionaries from the time I was uh, 10 years old. I remember um, I'm from the area, I'm from Tennessee, and, um, and my dad was a pastor of a church in Tennessee. And one day, I was 10 years old, I was actually loading the dishwasher, and um, dad said, I've, we've been praying about it for a while, and the Lord is leading us to go to the Dominican Republic as missionaries. And he told me we're going to La Romana, Dominican Republic as missionaries. And I remember that moment so vividly because that's the last dishwasher I ever owned, which is really sad. (laughs) Sad. I don't know, you guys, y'all with your dishwashers and your, you know, your fancy coffee makers and, but um, now one of our themes of our, of our, of our um, family was wherever he leads, I'll go. My mom used to uh, sing that with around the piano. And you guys know that song, wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so wherever he leads, I'll go. And so that was just the theme of our, of our family. So when the Lord was calling us to the Dominican, we, we went. We went to Mexico first. We were in Mexico for language school for uh, about a year. And um, we all, almost all of us learned Spanish, except for my mom, but she can get by. Um, I was already 12 by the time we got to Mexico. My parents were already 40. So imagine learning and hearing Spanish for the first time at that age. They had it, them, dad didn't struggle, but mom really struggled with the language. But she gets by and um, she just, if she gets angry, she speaks better Spanish than, <laughs> so if, if she's really struggling, if she's really struggling with a word, if she has to speak Spanish, you just walk up and slap her and, and she will do better. She'll speak better Spanish. Um, but that was, and so when we moved to the Dominican Republic, I was, I was uh, 13 by the time we got there, which I, anybody who has ever had a 13 year old, that's a hard age to become a missionary. However, that was our life. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Wherever he leads, I'll go. So that was our theme of our family. And, um, and so we lived in the Dominican Republic for nine years. And um, the, Lord, uh, the Lord called my parents back to the States. And they were not happy with that decision. We loved the Dominican Republic. We loved the people that we worked with. My mom called me. By this time I was in college, my mom called and Allison, I don't, the Lord's calling us back, but I don't want to go back to the States. I want to stay here. We love this country so much. And, uh, and then she, when they got back to the States after a few months, um, she was actually diagnosed with stage three lymphoma. 
and um, and they were in a church uh, in Georgia, and the church just really loved on them and and uh, and helped them through that, and uh, the Lord uh, healed her, and uh, so we're thankful. And she's she and mom, uh, she and dad are back down in the Dominican serving with us now, uh, here um, now that we've been there as a as a married couple. Um, but one of the things, when I was living down in the Dominican Republic, I was working, um, somebody came on a missions trip, his name was Gary Hale, and my aunt was on this missions trip too, and my aunt said, you sh he's cute, you should hit on him. And I'm like, first of all, I don't hit on guys, but wherever he leads, I'll go, so. Um, so that is just, and uh, so we met in the Dominican Republic. I was his translator, and uh, he was literally, he said the longest salvation prayer ever. I'm praying, you know, he's praying, and I'm translating it into Spanish, and I'm like, dude, they've got it. They're, they're good. They're, they're all saved. Again, they've, you know. And uh, so if you are here, if you're going to be here tomorrow, he will be preaching, and in in, he will be preaching. I will not be translating for him tomorrow. Um, but we've been uh, we've been married 19 years. We got married on April Fool's Day, the year 2000, and we are really married. We double checked just to make sure. But um, and so and then we've been in the Dominican uh, since 2003. And when when I first got down to the Dominican, that's one of the things that we um, my passion at that moment was just discipling women. I wanted to spend time. Uh, once a woman got saved, I wanted to spend time in the Word with her and get her to the point where then she could. Um, lead others to the Lord and and, uh, and 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 be firm in the Word of God. And so the first two women that were saved in our church, I began discipling them just every Wednesday. I would go to their house, um, and I would go to Marta's house, I would go to Carolina's house, and just disciple, disciple, disciple. And then an aunt would get saved, or a cousin, or a sister, and I would continue every Wednesday. Um, that was That was my that was my ministry. That was my passion, and um, so a few years later, one of the one of the women that I had discipled came up to me, and uh, and said, "Do you know what's happening in our country? Do you see this the problem that we we have?" And uh, and I had seen a little bit, and the Lord had used um, just little things to kind of start opening my eyes and preparing me for what we were we were about to do. She was sharing with me the problem of the sex trade, the sex tourism industry, um, in not only in the city that we were uh, that we were living in, but also in the tourist areas around. And uh, so we just started praying, but thankfully, because of the foundation of discipleship, it wasn't just little Allie, the American missionary, going out into the streets. I had an army of discipled and um, Bible, um, Bible strong women to go with me out on the streets. And um, I mentioned that you can go to a little tiny store and get just a little bit of sugar or a little bit of rice. Um, a little. You, there's corner stores all over the all over the. Um, in every little neighborhood, there's several little corner stores called Colmados, and um, people can go and just buy maybe one piece of bread, or just a little bit, five pesos worth of, of, of butter, or just a little bit of oil, and a little bit of rice. And uh, so when we went out to, on the streets to these women, we started just listening to their stories. And the first time I ever went out there, we heard that they were all mothers, all their children. Uh, they would wait until their children would go to sleep at night, and then they would lock the door and they would go out on the streets and hope that they could make just enough money for the next day to be able to feed their families. And they know how much they needed. They needed maybe four pieces of bread, maybe two pounds of rice, one egg. So they all had it down to the peso, down to the little uh, the, the coin, how much money they needed to be able to feed their families the next day. And that's how much they were hoping to make through prostitution the night, the night before. And it just broke my heart because it just sounds so many times like stories in the Bible of these women who just have a little bit of flour, just a little bit of oil. And, uh, and so it just struck me. So we kept going out on the streets. Uh, every Thursday night we would go out on the streets and talk to these women. And every time they would just unpack a little bit more of their story. Now the first time I went out on the streets, I was, we were all worried about, okay, we're going out on the streets. We're going to talk to these women. We're church ladies. We don't know what to what to wear, what to say, what to do. We were really worried about, I don't know why, we were so worried about what we were going to wear. Um, but it was just, we didn't, we didn't want to be two church ladies, but we didn't want to be mistaken for, yeah. 
you know, anyway. Um, and so we decided on jeans and big earrings. That's what we decided, you know, just, you know, just some. So we were like, okay, we'll wear jeans. And we needed to make sure we didn't bring our Bibles. Whatever we had in our hearts, that's what we had to share. And so Bible memorization was super important to us. We never thought about what we should actually say. And um, so I'm, and you can tell after you've met me, a few, a few, Penny knows, several of you know, um, your pastor's wife knows, Shirley knows, I just don't stop talking. And sometimes somebody just needs to, you know, sometimes I, you know, everybody's like, oh, the Holy Spirit will give me the words. I'm like, I need the Holy Spirit to shut me up. I need him to make me stop talking. Just, I keep going. And so the first time we went out on the streets, we talked to these women and I had prepared just a little card. Here's our phone number. And so I said, um, here's our number. God loves you. We love you. If there's anything you need, please call this number and we can, we can help you. And uh, that God's purpose for your life is something so much different. So we would keep going. And then I just didn't know when to stop. And so the first time I ever, okay, it's time to wrap it up, land the plane, I said, good luck. And I was like walking away and my ministry partner said, don't say good luck to a prostitute. Poor girl, you know, why would you say good luck? And I was like, I don't know. I didn't know what to say. So she's like, well, don't say good luck. So the next time we went out, um, you know, had it prepared and like, don't say good luck, don't say good luck. So it's like, um, the Lord loves you. We love you. He has such a purpose for your life. And it's not, it's not this, but you know, he still, he loves you no matter what. So just, you know, call us and we can talk to you more about Christ. And then I said, since I didn't say good luck, I actually did say this. I'm not even lying. I said, enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs> That ain't the worst part. The next time we went, I was talking, right? How could it get worse than that, right? Um, the next time we went out, you know, we had cards. I had a, we now, now we had a burner phone because now we're pros. We know what to say. And I said, um, I said, the Lord loves you. He has, I don't know why my ministry partner just stood there, why she didn't. Anyway, I said, the Lord loves you. We love you. If there's anything you need, please, please give us a call. And there's a very very common phrase in the Dominican Republic um, that you would know, palante que va, you know, and in English that means keep up the good work. <laughs> right? So anyway, it's just embarrassing. I actually said that. And so then it's like, okay, now I'm, and the Lord was like, and you were worried about what you wear. That's funny. <laughs> I'm like, I know, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, but we, uh, we just, we spent time with these women. We got to pray with them. We got to sit down outside um, the bar areas and just kind of drink a Coke and just listen to them unpack their story. And many of them had been in this situation either pimped out by family members or exploited by, um, by a neighbor in the neighborhood since they were 10, 12, 13 years old. Um, and they had been in that's where their trauma happened. And then they're not educated. They don't have paperwork. Um, and so now they're just kind of stuck in this cycle. And then we're seeing the cycle continue because now it's generational. Now they have daughters. So the first couple of women that we were actually able to serve, one of them came to me and she's like, my daughter's not stupid. She goes to sleep at night, but what if she wakes up in the middle of the night? She's going to know what I do. She's 14 years old. You know, she's going to figure, I don't want her to become, I don't want her to do what I'm doing. And I'm, I'm working to put her in school and I, you know. And so we, what we did was we created Mercy Jewelry. And we just started teaching these women how to make jewelry. And so they could make jewelry, we could sell the jewelry, and then they could get, have a salary and what they called an honored job. That's something that they could go home and say, I earned this money with my hands. I'm, I, it's, an, it's, a, it's, an, it's a dignified job. It's a beautiful job because they make beautiful stuff. Um, but more than that, um, they're sitting in, and they were really, in, it was very interesting. They wanted a cushioned chair. They're like, if I come and work with you, will you give me a cushion for my chair? Absolutely, we will give you a cushion for your chair. Um, but they wanted to be able to look in their in their children's eyes and say, "This is I put food on the table with my, you know, with in a, in a dignified way." And so that was what we were. That was our passion was just giving them a job. And so the first woman that we were able to serve, she's been off the street now um, for ten years. Um, her daughter is now a college graduate. And so that's one of those, it's just a general, it's a generational cycle broken. And that's happened several times throughout, our, uh, throughout the ministry because we're just trying to break that cycle. Um, but the mothers are just trying to feed their children. And, um, and when you think about the cold mother when they go and they just say, I need, you know, just five pesos of rice or just one, 
one one piece of bread and one egg that I'm gonna I'm gonna have to you know split it between um, split it with my children and you just you think about the widows in the Bible that have had that and you just think of specific stories there's one in second Kings chapter 4 um, that I uh, that I I'm thinking of specifically 2 Kings chapter 4. This is a woman who, she's a widow, she has two sons, and she goes to, um, she goes to Elisha and she gives him her problem. All right. Um, she gives. She says, "You know, my husband is dead. My husband did serve the Lord, but now he's he served as a prophet, um, and and he is he is dead." It's in First King or Second Kings. I'm sorry, chapter four. Um, and she's just kind of telling. She's telling what the problem is, and Elisha comes back, and so we're going to read it. Um, Elisha comes back and just asks kind of what she has to offer. And it reminds me so much of what we do out on the streets sometimes because um, they come to us and they, they know that they need something. They don't know what they don't know. They don't know what they need. Um, and a lot of times they try to organize their life in a way that, um, you know, because they want to try to fix their life before they go to God. And we're trying to say, don't. No, go to God first and then he'll you know, he'll fix all of those problems. But Satan has sold them the lie. Satan has just said, you know, he's, he's given them a little bit of truth and a whole lot of lie. What he says is, God, yes, God loves you, but he will not accept you until you clean up your own life first. Because Satan knows that they will stay there trying in that cycle. They will try to clean up their own lives. And so he's given them so many times when I'm out on the streets, these women, they're like, yes, I know God loves me, and I'm, I pray that you would come out tonight to talk to us. I just need to clean up my life first. And I tell them over and over again, and I talk to them about, if, do you wait until you're, uh, until you're well before you go to the doctor? Or do you wait until your child is grown before you start feeding him? No, these are things, and I'm trying to you know, put it in words that they understand, because Satan has just kept them out on the streets with that lie. God will accept you when you are clean enough for him. And we know that we're not going to ever get clean enough for him until we let his righteousness uh, work in our lives. And, uh, and we know that, but we've had a, a pew to hear it. And we've had a cushioned chair to be able to sit and listen to that. They've been out on the streets and they're trying to hear this, me they're trying to hear this meshe message um, as, as so many things are happening. Their, ch their, ch their children are hungry. Their children are sick. They're out on the streets. This woman, this... Uh, crazy missionary with the big earrings is talking to them, but so many clients are passing by, and they're like, Allison, you need to talk faster because I have a job to do, and so I have to get all of my, I have to talk really fast um, to get all of my words in for the, so I can make them understand that it's God that does the work. They don't have to do the work. I'm not doing the work. It's God that has to do the work. And in this situation, in 2 Kings chapter 4, I'm just going to go ahead and read um, the this, this story, and then we'll talk about it. We'll unpack it a little bit. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Um, it's interesting where she, she knew he was going to ask that question. Because who, what woman has not just looked around the house in a time of need and just looked around the house and thought, you know, what do I have? And I know that these women in the Dominican, they think that the, all they have is that, is their body. That's the only thing that they have that they can use to feed their children. Um, when we first started the school, it was, we needed 80 children in the school to be able to pay the bills. Uh, we only got 39 children, and so every month, every two weeks, it was, you know, half, half of the bills are not paid because, you know, and so every month God would do some sort of miracle. And I remember one time, I was the administrative, uh, I was the administrative principal, or I was the educational principal, and Diomatis was administration. And so she's looking around the room, and I'm in charge of discipline, I'm in charge of curriculum, I'm in charge of education, and she's in charge of keeping the doors open, keeping the lights on, and keeping the teachers paid. And so she's looking around uh, the room, and I said, what are you looking? She's like, I'm looking for something to sell. <laughs> she's, we've got to make payroll in like two minutes, you know, and I'm like, we're looking around, and my eyes landed on one little kid named Jimmy, because he was in in-school suspension that day, and we both looked at him at the same time, we're like... He 
you know, so we're still looking around, you know, um, and it was interesting that day, God, God brought miracles, God uh, brought money at the last minute, we had no idea, um, and it was one of those things that, you know, at the end of the day, we were just dancing around the office, just yay, you know, God did it, God did it, and then the next day, we show up, and the pump broke of the, uh, of the work, and so we couldn't, flush toilets all day, we couldn't wash hands all day, and in an elementary school, that's pretty hideous. And, um, but then we heard this really loud noise, and the tank that was on top of the apartment building next to us, there's a large water tank on top, it broke and poured all of the water onto our little tiny school, so we just grabbed buckets, and we're like, look the way the Lord provides, and I'm going, <laughs> really? You know, he's just testing our faith. So in this situation, this widow has already, I know she's already looked around her house to try to find this problem. She let, Because he's asking her, what do you have in the house? And back in those days, it's a situation where a woman's worth was in her children, okay? And she had two boys, and she did not want to lose those boys. And those boys were about to get sold into slavery because of her husband's debt. And, and that's where her worth was, except for that one pot of oil. And I think so many times women are always trying to measure their worth by something based on what society says. Is my worth in, in how I look? Is my worth in my degree that I have? Or is it, is it in my job? Or is my worth in what this man in this relationship is telling me what my worth is. And she says, I have, I have oil. And it's so interesting that the most valuable thing in her house is one thing that throughout the Bible God has used over and over again to anoint kings, to anoint prophets, to pour on to people, to give power of the Holy Spirit. And so that's what she has in her house, and it's just a little pot of oil. And, um, and she's just looking at her worth, and so many times, and she has those children, and um, my husband and I, uh, we've been married 19 years, uh, we have prayed and asked the Lord for babies and children, and um, he has not given us those, uh, he has not given us babies, he has not given us children. I've used to walk outside the door and just hope there was one on my porch. I mean, that's how I was like, I want one, you know. Um, and it's just one of those things. I traveled to Zambia and last year with uh, Reba and Lisa, and they're, they're all about their children over there in Zambia. And I know we're all about our children. And I was trying to explain it because now I've been married 18, 19 years. The ship's kind of sailed. I mean, you know, I know everybody tells me about Hannah. Please don't come and talk to me about Hannah. I know Hannah. <laughs> Sarah. I get it. I know it. Uh, yes, God does work miracles. I'm not. I'm not complaining. Uh, God, the miracle that God has given me, is a satisfaction in Him, and a love for the people that He's given to me. It has not been biological children. And I was trying to explain this to the Zambian women, but they just couldn't get it in their heads for a while. They're like, "You don't have children." I'm like, "No, no, no. I have so many children. I have 400 kids at the school. I have nine women and all of their children at the workshop. I ha God has given me children. It wasn't what it looked, what I thought it was going to be, but he has given me children and he has given me a satisfaction in him. And that is such a miracle. And they're like, yeah, but Hannah, I'm like, I know, but Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> and so this one woman, an older Zambian lady wanted to pray with me. And, um, that's, please don't come up and give me remedies afterwards. We're, me and God are fine. We really are. Um, we've have had Dominican women hand me bottles of stuff. Um, there were so many bottles in the Dominican Republic. There are so many bottles in my pantry. Gary's like, what is this? I'm like, it's supposed to help us have babies. And he's like, oh, I don't know. I'm like putting it in a spaghetti sauce just in case. Just in case. Leave no stone unturned, you know? And, um, you know, whatever. So this Zambian lady wanted me, and she wanted me to pray with her, and she was going to pray for me to have a baby. And, um, and so anyway, so we went back into a corner, and I said, it's okay, you can, that's fine. What, it's fine. And, um, and so she said, now I want you to repeat everything I say. In my prayer, I, say, I pray it, and you repeat after me. I said, okay, I can do that. So she's holding my hands, and so she said, dear Lord Jesus, I love you so much. And I'm like, yeah. Dear Lord Jesus, I love you so much. And if I didn't repeat what she said, she would like scream it louder and shake me a little bit. <laughs> so, dear Lord Jesus, I love you, yes. And uh, so, um, forgive me for my sins. Yes, forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for, for those bad words that I said. And I'm like, 
Forgive me for those bad words I said. How did she know? <laughs> Forgive me for not having enough faith in you. Yes. Forgive me for not having enough faith in you. Give me a baby, Lord. Give me a baby, Lord. Give me twins, Lord. And she like shook me. She's like, give me twins, Lord. So I had to repeat it. Give me twins, Lord. But I'm like, no, dude, it's fine. I'm fine. <laughs> but I was trying to explain to the women what the Lord has given me. I must be grateful for that. I I, that's the miracle. It's just as much a miracle, the satisfaction and the, and the thankfulness, the deep relationship and intimacy that I have with him. That is just as much of a miracle as if I had a baby right now and I'm 44. And, and so it's, you know, and um, so that's what the women, in the women in the Bible, that's where their worth was. And, um, and she's like, I have two children and I have a pot of oil. And, uh, and so... Elisha said, then he said, go, borrow vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. That's a big phrase right there. Borrow not a few, and then when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and thou shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt, thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, bring me yet a vessel. And he said, there is, and he said unto her, there is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. And then she came and told the man of God, and he said, go, sell the oil and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. And I think it's just, I, I love this story because Elisha's like, Elisha's telling her, God's going to do something. God's going to multiply what you have. This little bit of oil, which is so valuable, which is oil that just signifies so much of the power of the Holy Spirit and signifies so much of who she is and who her children are. And he says, and he makes sure she knows, borrow not a few. And I'm looking, I look at this, um, I was looking at, at the, at the poem, disturb or the prayer, disturb us, Lord, when we are too pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we dreamed too little. And Elisha is telling her, borrow not a few because God is going to do something really big with what you already have that you find your worth in. He's going to do something big for your children. You have a vision that your children are not going to be in slavery, that your children are going to be just like their father, be a prophet that serves. Okay, but the vision is you have this little oil, but you have to start preparing the vessels. And so many times throughout the Bible, we hear about faith, and faith is so is is scary, and it's and it's it's mystical. But in this particular story, God gives us a God gives us a picture of an actual faith that can be measured, and it can be it, how much faith she had was based on how many pots and vessels she had gathered. And Elisha told her up front, borrow not a few. Um, we have allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim. It's in that prayer that, um, that you guys, uh, of your theme. Sometimes we limit and we show God how little faith we have based on just, we've only prepared a little, a little bit for what you're gonna do. Um, and we limit God, and we can actually measure. In this story, we can measure her faith by how many pots she and her boys gathered and how many pots she had prepared. And she had enough. It's obvious she had enough because she was able to sell the oil, pay all the debts, and live on the rest. So she had done her job. Her faith was huge, but you could see it because it was so many so many pots of oil that she just kept pouring and the Lord kept multiplying. And I think so many times in our lives, in our families, in our ministries, we want God to do something big, but we've only prepared a couple of pots and prepared and cleaned and, and, and gathered just a couple of vessels. And he's like, I have so much more oil. I have so much more oil for you. And my oil is so powerful but you haven't prepared your life or you haven't prepared the pots or you haven't gotten the vessels and gathered the vessels and made sure they were clean so that I can start pouring my oil, my powerful miracles into. And it's, one of, and it's just one of those things when, um, 
we have a, a woman that we serve in the Dominican Republic. She came to us, she had eight children. And uh, so at that time, we were allowing women to come into our workshop and, and serve and do and make jewelry. Um, and we were allowing them to bring their children, but I was like, eight, no but I love you, but I'm sorry, but eight is a lot of children to have at the workshop. And because we've got scissors and pliers and pins, and I do not know how many times throughout the years, and Penny was there um, when, we, um, when we had children at the workshop, and I don't know how many beads those children swallowed and pooped out into their diapers, and no, none of the jewelry that you made has ever passed through. <laughs> We never had to dig any of those pearls out of the diapers. But, I mean, it's just, it's an OSHA nightmare, honestly. I mean, you know, if, if anybody came in, um, you know, we've got scissors, kids walking around with, you know, and so, and the women, uh, you know, are, are taking care of their babies and they're trying to make jewelry. And so when Cynthia came, she was like, I've got eight children and I'm, I'm tired and I cannot support them with what I'm doing. And... You know, so what we did was we taught her how to make paper beads. And we taught her, she came into the workshop for a couple of days, and we taught her how to roll little paper beads. And, um, and so I said, you go home and make paper beads, and we'll just buy everything that you make. We'll buy them from you, and then you can stay at home with your kids, and we can, and you can, but you can be part of our ministry, but you'll be, your eight kids will be there, and there's, you know, okay. Whew. Well, anyway, so the first, so I said every month you just call us when you got your beads done and we'll pay you and, and, and hopefully that's what, that's what we'll do and we'll use them and, you know. So anyway, the first month, you know, she had 4,000 beads. <laughs> she brought this big bag and I had to count them one at a time. One, two, three, 4,000 beads. And, um, and so I said, how did you do this? And she said, well, I sent out my kids, just like this widow in the story, sent out her kids to gather vessels. She sent out her kids to just find paper. Um, they would go to the stores and have the stores, you know, keep all the extra, you know, big, you know, big items, boxes, uh, anything that they could find. And they would bring all this paper, and the kids would cut it up, and she would roll it. And I just, I love this story because it reminds me so much of Cynthia and all of her little kids that run around the, this, the village that they were in and um, to find pretty paper, and, they, and they were, the colors were gorgeous. And what's so funny is every month it was more and more. So the next month it was 6,000, then 8,000. And then, and then I tried to have, and I didn't want to limit her, but at the same time, I'm like, okay, now we have a lot of beads. And we had to order containers for the beads and bring the pots in because the oil didn't come, the paper beads came. And um, we were just, and it, it just reminded me of this story because she said, you know, I know what, I have one little tiny thing that I can do. And me and my boys are going to go out. We're going to find what we can. And then, and the Lord allowed us to be part of that and allowed her community to be part of that. Just like the story, the neighbors started sharing these vessels. And the neighbors started, because the neighbors became part of the story because they can look at a vessel and say, hey, I, I helped this widow with what I had. I had an empty vessel. She needed an empty vessel. And it's just part of the community um, that we when women can help one another. And, and again, that's another picture in this story. I just love this story so much. But she could look at these vessels and she could look at this, the oil, and think, all I did was just bring, a, bring some vessels and I just started pouring. But it was the Lord and it was God's power that just became, just kept pouring it on. So I could show my boys the miracle of God and I can show the neighbors that are all worried about me they're just handing me pots they don't know what they don't know what to do with it and they're just handing me pots and I've got this oil and her faith was big enough to sustain her and her family and I think so many times um, God's looking at us saying I have more oil but you haven't prepared the pots you haven't prepared the vessel you haven't cleaned you haven't you haven't been prepared and you didn't have enough faith. And I'm not talking about prosperity here. I'm just talking about God wants to do something in our lives and in our families. And he's got the oil to pour on us, but we just, we really just need to prepare that, to prepare that oil. Um, one of the women that we serve right now in our ministry, um, she came to us right at the beginning, and I was talking to Penny and Joe last night about the loan shark problem in the Dominican Republic. The tourism industry and the sex exploitation um, is, is big. It's huge and it's scary. But there's another, there's another level, and it's the loan sharks. 
and we had um, we had a woman come to us and she said I needed I needed blood for one of my babies because he was, he was he was sick he was at the doctor I needed to buy one pint of blood and I had to go get that blood and I didn't have any money so I went to a loan shark so I now owe the loan shark 4,000 pesos which is about eighty dollars she owed him 4,000 pesos right at the beginning um, which is eighty dollars but then he took the pa he took the papers to her house because that's what they do. He lends you money, and until you pay all of this back plus interest, he has the papers of her house. And so now she's afraid because this has been a year and a half ago, and she still hasn't paid him back. And so instead of owing him four thousand pesos, she owes him twenty thousand pesos for a pint of blood. And he owns the papers of her house. And so when she came into the ministry, I was, she was telling me everything to do. And our program, the way it works now is you come into the workshop. We teach you. We get, we get your paperwork together. We give you counseling. Obviously, there's women at the church who come in and teach the Bible. And we do Bible studies and discipleship. You work a little bit with jewelry, but most of the time, you're in some sort of training. And instead of paying you money, because we know of the loan shark situation, what we do is we go to your house with you. We pay the rent. We take you grocery shopping and make sure you have enough for food every week. And then any medicine and, and uh, any medical issues that you have, we go with you either to the doctor, to the lab, or buy you the medicine. So money doesn't, so they can't go to a loan shark and say, I have a job. They, the loan shark is like, hey, I want to lend you money. Well, I don't have a job. I'm in, an, I'm in, a, I'm in a training program. And so um, this is just for the first few months as we first spend time with them and we serve them in counseling, we serve them in a Bible study, and, and then after three months, if they've done well in the program, then they can start earning money. Um, but their, their needs are all met. And so she's like, but I have this, I have this, I have this debt. And the debt was huge, and one of, our, one of the women of our church went with her to talk to the loan shark. And she came back to me, she's like, that guy is horrible. And I said, I know. And she said, he's got the papers on everybody. He's got everybody's, he owns everybody's house. He said, but she talked him into not, she was going to, they were trying to get it back to the original. They were trying to get him back from 20,000 to just 4,000 pesos debt. He was not going to go there, but he stopped interest. So that's huge. He stopped interest. So we only owed him, um, 20,000 pesos. And, um, so anyway, she came to me and she said, what, how about, my, can you give me my grocery money? I said, I cannot give you your grocery money. So what we can do is we can hold your grocery money back. And she said, I'll clean houses and I'll weave hair and I'll do, I'll do what I can and I'll make money, a little bit of money. I'll, you know, and so we worked out a deal. So after about a, after about a month, she came to me and she just had a whole roll of money. She said, here's what I have. What do you have? And I pulled out my all my roll of money and so we're putting it together and we prayed over it <laughs> we're like lord please help this horrible man accept this i don't even know what it is i didn't even count it i, I did not count it because i was like lord this is you know we've she's done her part in a big way we did what we could um based on you know based on our what what we felt like we could do and she came back the next day and she showed me the papers to her house and she said he forgave the debt and i've got my i've got my house back and i was just like oh I don't even know how much, I have, no, I, I have no idea, but all I know is God took that and what he, either he prepared the guy's heart or he multiplied it on the way or he had multiplied it while I was in my office, you know, in my, a pair of shoes. Um, it was, and, but God took it and he multiplied it. And, and we see stories like that over and over again, but it's because Elisha says, what do you have? And she said, all I have is just this oil. And he says, get some pots and don't get a few because God's going to do something with your pots and, and his oil. And so many times we look at our worth as women and we think, I just don't have anything to give. We think about our energy level. I have no more energy to give. How many have been there? How many are there this morning? I'm like, 8 o'clock on a Saturday morning? Really? With not Santo Domingo coffee? <laughs> and, and I was there. I was there just a few years ago. I mean, I was, I was in a broken state. Number one, because I was bitter. Because I felt like I had done, I had obeyed God. So it was my turn 
for a baby. I had taken care of everybody else's. Now it's my turn. Give me what I want, please. Um, and I and I just I was in a broken state, and my our, our ministry was broken, and I was broken, and I was just I was serving the Lord just from an empty, empty vessel. I didn't have oil to give. I had an empty vessel, and I was trying to just keep pouring out from that empty, empty vessel. And the Lord's like, "That's not how it works. You have to have my oil, and you have to have." my strength and it's not in your own strength and that's where I was I shared a little bit with Penny and and Gary and I my husband and I got we just said we were sitting in the backyard and I'm like I and he was like do you want to still be here in the Dominican I'm like I love the Dominican I love the people I'm just so tired because and it was because I hadn't gotten what I wanted my vision and my dream was I, I wasn't allowing God to take that and oil it up. You know, I wasn't him allowing him. I was I wasn't I hadn't taken him anything else. I was just like this is my vessel and it's empty, but it's mine and I'm keeping it. And Elisha, you know, what do you have? I have oil. I have I have a pot. That's all I have. And he's like give it to the Lord and let you know, and that's what he said to this widow. And he finally, not Elisha, but God's word just finally said, listen, let it, your pot is empty. Let me fill it with you or with my oil and just get it to where I can pour out blessings onto, onto your ministry. And that when that happened, what I can pour out now on women that are not my children, but they are. I, I got a text the other day. Somebody said, mom, I need this and this and this and this. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you know. And I don't even have to change his diaper. Somebody else has to do that. <laughs> um, and I can sleep late on Saturdays. But that's one of the things that I'm just so thankful that the Lord can pour, the Lord can pour out through me. But I had to just take him my vessel and say, listen, it's your oil, it's your power, it's your Holy Spirit. Please forgive me for not believing in and in, in having faith and not preparing that that vessel for your use um, in the next uh, the next session we're going to be actually work looking at another woman in the Bible and um, it's going to be a little bit it's going to be a little bit more um, it's not as sweet a story as just pretty pots and oil but it's just as powerful of story of how the Lord can use uh, use a woman who just makes a decision a decision for him Thank you so much. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that there are women here who just want to be disturbed by your Holy Spirit and be unsettled so that they can begin or they can continue using your Holy Spirit in their, in their lives to, to pour out on others, to pour out on their families, um, to even sit and allow you to pour into them, Lord. I just pray that you would give us the strength to continue to prepare vessels for your honor and glory, Lord, so that your oil can pour through us, so that, so that we can be filled and that we can begin pouring out on others. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, wow, just Jesus is kind and his Holy Spirit is working, and um, I can't wait for the rest of the day. So we're gonna move into breakout sessions. There'll be three happening. Um, you can go to the Armor of God with Cynthia Barksdale, and that's gonna be over in the Home Builders Room where breakfast was this morning. Um, how to enjoy reading your Bible with Penny Drago and uh, Jana up in the, san uh, the balcony of the sanctuary, so just right up here. Um, and then trusting God for our wellness with uh, Charlotte and Sarah in the youth room. So those are, classes will begin promptly at 10.15 and will end at 11. So um, we have about 15 minutes to transition, to choose, um, use restroom, whatever you need to do. Um, and if you can't choose between one or you're stuck, they will be recorded and they'll be put up later so you can see all of them. So go ahead. <laughs>